Welcome back everyone, I'm Keegs, and today we are going to be picking up with the final prequel book in the Thrawn Ascendancy trilogy called Lesser Evil. This book picks up right after the events of the second book, Greater Good, and if you're not familiar with the events of what happened there or don't remember, you can click right up here to watch my previous video talking about the events of that book. But for now, let's get into it and talk about Thrawn's final moments in the Ascendancy. Like all of the Thrawn books, this one kind of jumps between perspectives and timelines a lot, so it can be a bit confusing, but this book starts off with Jixtus, the mysterious Grisk that we don't know much about, and he's talking to the Kilji, who are a group of basically cultists that call themselves the Enlightened, and they're going around and teamed up with Jixtus kind of so that they can find planets where they can essentially force their enlightenment upon people. While traveling through the chaos, which is just what the Chiss call the space around them, they encounter a ship, and aboard that ship is our favorite character, Thrawn. Now, Thrawn kind of tries to goad Jixtus into attacking him, and, you know, just so that he can start a battle, because the Chiss have this whole protocol about they're never allowed to attack first, so he's trying to get Jixtus to attack him, but... Jixus knows that that is a bad idea and he's just not prepared for it at the moment. It doesn't serve his best interests. So he is able to just kind of leave and say, you know what, I'm going to step down for a sec and just go away. And it's just can't really do anything about it because of how their protocol works. So Thrawn decides, OK, time to go back to Chila, the homeworld of the Chiss. Meanwhile, Admiral Arlani is fighting a battle on a I guess it's more of a skirmish on a spaceport. Eventually, they realize that this spaceport is not just a spaceport, but a surveillance port. And they realize that this was surveilling the battle with Yiv, uh, General Yiv, from the first book that Thrawn ended up taking out. And when they kind of come to this realization, Arlani understands that Yiv was not the top dog and there was someone above him which means there is a larger threat to the ascendancy than they had originally thought because they originally thought they took out Yiv they took out the threat to the ascendancy but that is not the case there is someone above him apparently. Senior Captain Lakinda is offered to join the Arizi family which is a huge deal because the Arizi are one of the nine ruling families so it's a huge bump in station. And she was also not very happy with her current family because they threw a mutiny against her on her last mission in Greater Good, that second book of the prequel series. So she was really just kind of looking, you know, to get out anyway because she didn't feel like her current family had her best interests at heart. So she ends up joining the Arizi family. And something important to note is the Arizi family is one of which that is a enemy to the myth, which is Thrawn's family. When Thrawn arrives back to Chila, though, he goes and talks to Bakif, and Bakif normally really likes Thrawn and kind of sticks his neck out for him a lot, but Thrawn then reveals that he has the Magus in actually his Skywalker Cheery's bedroom right now, and that kind of gets Bakif to flip out a little bit because there are so many things wrong with that. It's like you can't even make a list of how against Chiss protocols and rules it is so anyways Thrawn ends up convincing Bakif that he needs to take the mages back to Sunrise her planet and Bakif eventually does agree to that so they're just gonna try to hide it essentially from the rest of the Ascendancy and be like okay look we can just go return her and it's fine nobody has to know about it on their way back to Sunrise, though, Thrawn encounters a battle, and when he arrives, he tells everyone to stand down or get embarrassed, which is great because, of course, they don't stand down, and they get embarrassed. It's revealed that that was a Kilji ship, and the Kilji, you know, working with Jixtus, so Thrawn is able to kind of take them out, and when he does that, an escape pod releases, and so Thrawn obviously tracks down the escape pod, and guess what? Who is in that escape pod other than our old friend, the navigator, Kalori? Thrawn interrogates Kalori to try to find out a little bit more information about who Jixtus is, but Kalori doesn't really have a lot of information to give, so Thrawn just says, okay, that's fine, you know what? I've made you this makeshift navigator helmet, and you're gonna take me to Sunrise. 
So Thrawn then puts his first captain, Simacro, in charge and tells him to take his heavy cruiser, the Springhawk, back to Chila and Thrawn and Kalori jump on a transport shuttle and head off in the other direction. Back on Chila, the new myth patriarch, Thurfian, has invited Zithalmu of the Arizi family to come and talk about how they're going to achieve their goal of taking down Thrawn. But Zistalmu is a little skeptical now because now that Thurfian is Patriarch, he thinks that his goals have changed or shifted and now he feels like the myth are actually just using him instead of actually trying to work together in this secret pact that they formed. So he doesn't really trust Thurfian anymore and kind of breaks off their agreement to take down Thrawn together and just storms out. Supreme General Bakif radios Arulani and talks to her about some hollows that have been going around provided by none other than Jixtus. And these hollows show a bunch of Chiss ships fighting each other and it really seems like it's trying to throw a lot of suspicion on the Klar family. Then Zyinda joins the conversation though and she says that she just witnessed a battle of these ships and she actually thinks that some of them might be fake ships to kind of look like the Chiss, or they're Chiss ships, but not really part of a Chiss family. Later though, Senior Captain Rosku shows up, and she kind of has a confrontation with Arlani, and it is revealed later that these two have a huge beef with each other, because Rosku feels that Arlani and Thrawn think they're above the law and every time they break protocol and everything it gets swept under the rug and it's like they have these mysterious protectors protecting them but she broke protocol once and she was stripped of rank and kicked out of the expansionary defense fleet so she really holds a lot of resentment for Arlani and Thrawn. After a bit of bickering though, and some clever tricks from Arlani's crew, Rosku ends up revealing that the ships are actually being manufactured by the two Chiss families, the Jurasclo and the Aragal. Man, I have trouble pronouncing some of these names sometimes. But anyways, she thinks that these people are manufacturing Chiss ships, which immediately Arlani realizes that that means the hollows were faked and Jixus is once again just trying to screw over the ascendancy. So Macro is commanding Thrawn's heavy cruiser back to Chila when all of a sudden Cheery the Skywalker starts having these force visions and she sees the Magus' home world planet Sunrise and starts to kind of freak out saying we have to go back. She convinces Samacro and her caretaker Thalius that they need to go back even though it's going to be a crazy amount of stress upon Cheery to navigate the ship for like a day straight. When the Springhawk shows back up to sunrise, they encounter a confrontation between the Kilji and Wingali of the Pakash. And if you remember, Wingali from Book 1 is the one that gave Thrawn his ring of the interweaving snake symbol, actually this symbol right here. And that's going to eventually be the symbol of Thrawn's ship in the Galactic Empire. But Smacro eventually figures out that Thrawn is aboard the Pakian ship, and they end up beating the Kilji. Though Thrawn does leave uh, some survivors so that they can deliver a message back to Jixtus that Sunrise is now under the control of the Chiss. Thrawn returns back to Chila eventually with the help of Kalori, and on his way he just sends a whole bunch of mixed messages to Kalori because he knows he's going to report back to Jixtus, and now his enemies are just kind of confused as to what's happening because they have all these conflicting reports. When the surviving members of that Kilji ship get back to Jixtus and tell him that they lost the battle encounter with Thrawn, Jixtus gets really angry, really for the first time so far. The Kilgis see this and try to get a little more bold with Jixtus because they think he's slowly starting to lose it, but he kind of regains his composure and whips them back in line pretty quickly. Arlani goes to a secret meeting to meet with General Yiv, who's being held captive on a prison in Chila, and really She's trying to get more information on Jixtus, but the only thing she really gets is that General Yiv is absolutely convinced that the Grisk are going to win this war, and he wants nothing other than just to get off Chila because he thinks that this is going to be a graveyard, essentially, and he has worse odds of staying on Chila when the Grisk invade than he would if he was on exile in some foreign planet. 
Now, I haven't talked about it yet, but throughout the book, they show lots of flashbacks to Thrawn at the beginning of the Ascendancy, and particularly when he met a man named Thrask, who was an adjudicator for the Myth family, and they kind of developed this strong friendship over time. On one mission in particular, though, they run into the Stibla family, who is trying to retrieve some cargo, but Captain Rosegu shows up and she is also trying to get that cargo. Eventually, Thrawn helps out the Stibla family and is able to retrieve it for them, but he kind of pisses off Rosku in that process as well. But we learn a lot about the Stibla through this process, and even though they're not one of the ruling families right now, we learn that not only were they once a ruling family, they were the ruling family. They were top dog, number one, everyone listened to them. And then, after many, many years, all of a sudden, they, the Chiss went to war with some alien civilization. And this civilization was going to win and defeat the Chiss, with the exception that the Chiss had one, one thing back in their pocket that they could use, which was an alien technology weapon called Starflash. Now, this was a really interesting weapon, because... What happens is, is it uses a lot of energy from the star that Chila orbits around. The problem with this weapon, though, was a couple things. One, when you use it, the star that you use it to power is greatly weakened and may never actually recover. Secondly, the entire crew that has to deploy the weapon will die because it will kill everything in front of it essentially and that includes the ship so what had happened was four myth family members had volunteered to go on this mission and to which the stibla were essentially forever grateful for and that's why the stibla and the myth have such a tight relationship and the thing is we find out that that cargo ship that they were trying to save is actually the other star flash weapon that they didn't use so obviously that is a monumental weapon. The Stylo were so appreciative of Thrawn rescuing that cargo for them that they end up giving him an honorary suffix on his name of Odo. So his name used to be Mithron Nir, and then it changed to Mithron Nirodo. And not only that, but Thrask, who is a cousin of the family, of the Myth family, ends up calling Thrawn his brother, which is a crazy high uh, praise for a merit adoptive to be called the brother of a cousin of the family. But back to present time though, Zyinda comes across Rosku who is going after this spaceport and trying to take it out, but Zyinda quickly realizes that there is a asteroid that is camouflaged and it's actually a huge cannon that's about to take out Rosku's entire ship. Now, Zyinda is able to save Rosku by firing some warning shots at her, which is, again, very against protocol. But she does that, and all of a sudden, Rosku is not really as thankful for being saved as she should be. Rosku does then talk to the Klar family patriarch, and he's just like the worst kind of dude you can imagine, the worst patriarch of them all. But he's like, whatever, it doesn't matter, go after this other thing and some, like, BS mission. But on their way, Rosku encounters an entire Grisk fleet just kind of hiding out, and all of a sudden, everybody in the crew starts to realize that the Klar family is working with the Grisks in order to get these ships. And that's just really, really bad for their entire family because now everyone thinks that the Klar is almost traitors to the Chiss Ascendancy, but... Rosku, just kind of being super stubborn, is like, you know what, we don't have all the facts, let's just uh, keep on going with our mission and we can talk about it later and we just have to trust that our patriarch is doing what's right for us. However, though, the Clark family patriarch is talking to Jixtus and informs him that Rosku did discover the fleet, but it's like, it's fine, she's loyal, she'll be loyal to us. Jixus is like, ain't no way in hell she's gonna be loyal to us, and he just buckles up, and he goes after her ship to destroy it, because he doesn't think that she's gonna be able to keep that kind of secret. Meanwhile, Thalius, the caretaker of Chiri, goes on a secret mission to Ool, and she's trying to find someone 
that is going to understand what Shiri's going through about having these visions and her force abilities starting to develop, really. Instead of fade away, they keep getting stranger with Shiri. She ends up finding this woman who is... You know, very friendly at first, but once Thalius mentions the Skywalker program, she gets uh, a lot less friendly and like pulls a blaster out on Thalius and is like, I'm going to kill you if you don't have a good reason for talking about that. And Thalius eventually mentions that Thrask sent her, and that's the only thing that gets this woman to put her blaster down. And it's revealed that this woman is part of the program that helps Skywalkers develop from a young age and gets them ready to navigate the ships. And with that, they kind of start to piece together that Thalius is missing some of her memories, and so is this woman that she is talking to. Her name is Borika. And now, Thalius eventually puts together that this woman, Borika, is wiping the memories of all of the Skywalkers from like before any time before they were like six and that's because they had some difficulties previously with skywalkers who missed their parents because you know when you take a really young child away from their parents they kind of miss them and they realize that if they just wiped the memories of the kids and the kids didn't remember the parents then they're a lot easier to control and are way happier doing their job so Thalys is really not happy about learning that but there's not a lot that she can do with it, but she does say that she's going to bring Cheery back for some further studying. On her way out, though, she does tell Rika that she knows who she is and reveals that she is actually the sister of Thrawn. Rika is really upset when she learns that information, mostly because she feels that Skywalkers should never learn about their past and their history, and she felt that that was information that she was really never supposed to learn. So it's just very interesting, and we'll have to see if Thrawn is ever able to meet his sister again, because I think that would be quite an interesting reunion, and I'd like to get to know Rika a little bit more since she seems to be very smart herself because she's running this whole Skywalker program and wiping the memories of kids and things and I just feel like that yep that sounds like someone in Thrawn's family. Once Kalori finally makes it back to Jixus though he starts telling him all the information that Thrawn told him and Th uh, Jixus is really confused because there's just a lot of contradicting stuff but Kalori does say that Thrawn is headed back to Chila alone and by himself so Eventually, Jixus is like, ah, okay, well, I don't, I don't need to go after Rosku. I'll go after Thrawn instead, and I'll send one of my lackey ships to go after Rosku and take her out because Thrawn is the bigger threat at the moment. That other ship that was sent after Rosku, though, is actually does not get the job done. Rosku doesn't defeat it, but she's able to escape, and now she really knows that her family sold her out, so uh, she's kind of pissed herself at this moment. Thrawn was able to make it back to Chila though before he was intercepted and he talks to Bakif about a plan to deal with this mysterious Jixtus. And when he does this, it's pretty much entirely against protocol of the Ascendancy. But essentially, Bakif does agree and him and Arlani start recruiting who they think would be allies of Thrawn and who would fight with Thrawn to take out this ridiculously powerful person that is just mysteriously operating and trying to take down the Ascendancy. Zyinda is recruited, and surprisingly, Rosku's ship is recruited, but Rosku herself has actually been demoted because the Klar Patriarch, when confronted with the Grisk fleet that he is harboring, demotes her and promotes the first captain to then command the ship that she is aboard. But that first captain is on Thrawn's side and does ally with him, and actually they end up going to the battle as well. Thalius goes to talk to the Myth Patriarch about sending help to Thrawn, but Thurfian obviously hates Thrawn because he and Zastalmu were trying to do everything they could to take Thrawn down, and he also doesn't like Thalius because Thalius outsmarted him at a couple different turns throughout the process as well. So he's really not inclined to help them at all. Eventually, Thalius goes a bit mad and pulls out a grenade and says, you're going to help him right damn now or I'm going to blow us both up. And 
Thurfian uh, does believe that she will actually pull the trigger on that, so he does end up sending some ships to the throne's aid. All the ships were then gathered in the Shista system, and when Jixtus shows up, he sees Thrawn's ship just kind of floating about in a giant pile of wreckage and a bunch of destroyed ships everywhere. And Thrawn says that he was able to defeat the Kilji before Jixtus arrived, but obviously his crew was mostly killed, all his fleet was killed, and his own ship has lost power. Jixtus sees this and gets really happy because there's not a lot that he's going to have to do now and everything that he wanted to do with and kill Thrawn and everything has already been done for him. But he doesn't want to just go and destroy Thrawn's ship because Thrawn still has the Magus aboard supposedly and Jixtus's whole plan here has been to capture the Magus because she can see snippets of the future and with this he plans on using the Magus to help him win different kinds of battles and essentially conquer more planets and probably the Chist entirely. So he doesn't do that immediately and he gets to talking with Thrawn and he brings out all of his fleet, all 15 Grisk giant warships and ends up like spreading them out and surrounding the Thrawn's ship. This is a bad move though because then all of a sudden knowing Thrawn, obviously we know he isn't in a bad predicament right now. He says, hey Jixtus, I know it looks like I only got this one broken ass ship, but I'm going to give you a chance right now to surrender. And Jixus is kind of like, wait, what? And all of a sudden, all of the ships in the wreckage start to come back to life, essentially. They like all power on and like they were floating around aimlessly is what it looked like. But really, it was all very strategically placed. And they just put like a bunch of scrap metal out there to look like the ships had parts blown off. But really, they were all fully intact and ready for a battle. So they all powered back on. And because they were able to take Jixtus by surprise, they were able to just completely F up his stuff. Because as soon as that happened, Jixtus hopped aboard a escape pod. And like he was on a little transport and then he went out and went to his command on the larger Grisk warship. It was a long battle actually, and even though Thrawn was able to take Jixtus by surprise and got a lot of ships out of the way that way, Jixtus's fleet was still really strong, and Thrawn ended up using an alien technology called the Gravity Well Generator, which we know is Republic technology, and he was actually able to defeat Jixus's entire fleet for once and for all, essentially. But before they could board any of the ships, the Gris do what they always do, and they self-destructed all of their ships because they don't want any Chist to know what the Grisk look like, which probably means that there's a lot of Grisk hiding in plain sight in Chist, uh circles because none of them actually know what the Grisk look like. And they've got this whole thing about, you know, not revealing their face to anybody. And they wear hoods and masks and things to obscure that because they're just kind of lying in wait for the day that they really take over the Chiss and can reveal themselves properly. I did want to mention though that even though Thrawn didn't use Star Flash to defeat Jixtus, he did mention that if that's what it was going to take to defeat him in order to sacrifice essentially the entire planet of Sunrise to beat Jixtus, he would have done it. And I think that's a very important character explanation expose piece on him because that's how Thrawn thinks. He will do literally anything he can in order to save the Chiss, whatever it takes, even if that means sacrificing entire planets of people. After the battle, though, Thales ends up taking Cheery back to Barika to perform many more tests and things, and really, this is where they're going to be for quite a long time, I think, because Cheery, at the end of the book, she mentions, she's like, hey, you know, what if this takes a ridiculously long time? What if it takes forever? And Thales just says, well, then it takes forever, but I'm here with you. We're going to do this together and find out. So I think they're setting up some more stuff for Cheery to return at some point and maybe retain some of her force abilities even past the ripe old age of 14. Thrawn ends up being exiled, and it's really just kind of a ruse from Thrawn and Bakif, and they had to satisfy the family's need for 
uh, punishment because they really feel like Thrawn has disobeyed their exact orders and the will of the Ascendancy, so they want to punish him, and they didn't know what else to do, so they ended up exiling him. Um, but then Bakif and Thrawn are talking, and basically what they're doing here is sending Thrawn out to investigate this new superpower in the galaxy known as the Galactic Empire. They heard that this thing is a massive superpower of an empire and they don't want it to attack the Ascendancy, first of all, so they want to keep an eye on it, but also they wanted to see if they can use the resources of the empire to help them with their own mission against future Grisk incursions. Meanwhile, Aralani is pretty pissed about Thrawn being exiled, but Bakif ends up calling her into the office so that he can tell her that, like, hey, yo, like, this is cool. I suggested the exile. Thrawn's on board with it. We know exactly what's happening. Here's the plan. So Aralani becomes a lot more content and she gets a lot less vocal because they were worried that Aralani was just going to make such a huge fuss about Thrawn being in exile that they would try to pull him back from exile, but then realize that he's not actually on that planet that they sent him to. Samacro also ends up getting re-promoted to command the Springhawk Heavy Cruiser. And really, that's pretty much the end of this prequel trilogy. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. Or if you had already read the book and are just trying to get a refresher, I hope this helped to uh, remind you of what happened and where things could possibly go. I feel like this book puts a lot of backstory into the Ascendancy and especially with Thrawn a potentially appearing in the Ahsoka series. We don't know what his goals are, but it seems like his goals would probably still be to take out the Grisk and protect the Ascendancy. So this information will probably help you understand heavily where Thrawn's coming from on these issues. The only thing about explaining books is I don't have any fun pictures to show anybody or put them, so you just gotta look at me. But I hope that wasn't too bad to look at. I'm Keegs, and I will catch you all next time for some more Star Wars content.